Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27. It should come up behind me. You have heard that it has been said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anybody who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in, with her in his heart. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away because it's better for you to lose part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So welcome to church this morning. And there's nothing controversial or difficult in my topic this morning. And so I'm going to be speaking on lust, adultery, and divorce. Some topics that uh, most people don't really want to talk about in our day and age because it's all around us. But let me share uh, a picture of or to you. And this is a lady called Emily. And her surname is somewhat unpronounceable, Rataja Kowalski. And uh, she's a supermodel. And she's well known for the fact that she danced naked in Robin Thicke's music video called Blurred Lines, which was uh, a top, uh, one of the, the top songs around last year. And uh, she was defending herself against a feminist who said, you've just used your nakedness and your, your, your ability to draw people through uh, your, your breasts and everything else um, to get yourself into a place of fame. So this was her response. It really bothers me that people are so offended by my breasts, she told Allure magazine. That's when I realized how messed up our culture is. When we see breasts, we don't think of beauty and femininity. We think of vulgar and over-sexualized images. Then there's a lady, and her name is Melton, sorry, Glennon Melton. And she is a Christian mommy blogger. Now, what that means is that over the years, she's, she's got millions of followers, and she writes these blogs around what it's like to be a wife, what it's like to be a mom, the difficulties in life, and all of that. And, you know, there's a lot of these kind of bloggers all out there. And uh, she recently got d- divorced. I mean, there's her wonderful family. She recently got divorced, and within six months, married one of the soccer moms. This was her response when people started to take her on. Please don't pretend to know what God thinks of us. Please think deeply about the chasm, the chasm-wide difference between leaving a man and leaving God. Please remember that when a woman leaves, she just brings God with her. Nothing separates a woman or a family from God's love. Not death and certainly not divorce. Jesus taught us that, Jesus taught us that sometimes death is necessary for there to be new life. And that God loves us far more than any institution that God made for us. When someone suggests otherwise, it brings shame upon us. But we won't let that in. We are women who have become far too wise to believe in shame. Now I'm sharing that with you not to try and say, okay, I want your opinion on what that is. We've all got a different opinion. And you know what? There's a lot of truth in both of what these women said. But we live in a world that justifies people's actions by just changing and uh, perverting the God, God's word. And so I'm not trying to point fingers at them. I'm not trying to get you to agree or disagree with what they've said or what I've said. But the point is, is I'm pretty sure that you know similar stories around the globe, friends, family, that would speak similarly to this. But what does Jesus say on the subject? He says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And like I said two weeks ago when I preached on anger, is this was when a rabbi says, you've heard it said, and then they quote an Old Testament scripture. So he's, he's quoted Exodus 20 verse 15. Number seven of the Ten Commandments, I spoke on anger, number six of the Ten Commandments last time. And as you know, when I said, you know, anger versus, you know, living in contempt with the brother, we can do don't murder. I mean, I don't think there's any murderers in here. There might be. Don't lift your hands because you'll just cause fear. you come through. But I don't think there's too many murderers, and we can all go, we can do that. I don't know about you, but I cannot murder. I've got that one. And even in the context of adultery, it's kind of like, well, you know, I've got a reasonably good marriage, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but a good marriage, and, and I think I can do this one. I think I can stay away from, from, you know, not divorcing or committing adultery. And um, the, the point is, is that what Jesus is going to do is he's going to pull back the curtain now. 
And we all think he's talking about certain things, but he's not. He's going to uncover that actually it's all about the heart. And I'm using the lollipop mic because I've got this cough, so I'm going to cough every now and again, so please excuse me. So, here he goes. And he, what he's saying is, if you remember, when, before he started this discourse, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Remember, end to end, it's not into the future. It's live in the kingdom of God that is available to us right now. None of the Sermon on the Mount is talking about heaven and hell eternity. None of it. It's talking about living in the context of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God now, and living out and what that means in the context of human flourishing, the way we were destined and designed to live, versus living in the context of hell, Gehenna, now. Not some kind of future destiny that we know does exist, but he's talking about the now. So he's not talking about the scribes and Pharisees who just changed their behavior. So because I don't commit adultery, I'm okay. Because I don't murder, I'm okay. And he goes, no, no, no. Now, if you hate your brother or sister, and he's going to get on to the next thing. And what he's saying is, no, it's not about those things. It's not about simply avoiding things or the way that we act. No, it's about being guided by the love of God and being in a relationship with Christ Jesus our Lord. So 28 says, but I tell you that anybody who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, if you're over 15 years old and you've got testosterone in your, your body, you're kind of going, I'm in trouble. I think every man in this room has committed adultery at least once in his life. Or am I the only one here? I've got a couple of stories for you. So Louise Jordan's probably seven or eight years old and driving on our way to school, dropping him off at his little flock kind of set up in primary school. And there's this poster and it's one of these, what, the review bar things, whatever. And it's this lady with big hair, and it's not the only thing that's big about her. And, uh, and she's got stars in strategic places. And it's really quite eye-catching. And um, so Louise got really indignant about this, and she calls up this place, because obviously there's a number there. And it's where men would go and frequent to watch ladies strip down and all kinds of stuff. And so she calls up this number, not knowing that when she called up this number, they've obviously got a system that captures her number. And so for the next couple of weeks, if not months, Louise kept getting texts about the events that they were having. And so we've got this thing between us where we check each other's phones, and I asked her the question, my babe, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah, and we had an elders meeting when these things started to pop up. Nevertheless, she called them up and managed to get hold of somebody and threatened all kinds of hell and brimstone if they did not remove her from their list, which they did. What about those sex poet ads? Another humorous story, but not. A man called Grant Crawford, he leads a church down in Peter Maritzburg, comes to preach at New Covenant Church, Branson, while we were still there. And if you remember out the first expo picture, I do, I'm a man. It was a woman in a G-string with her backside being photographed. And it was on the N3, just by Alexander there. Alexander, I don't know if you remember it. Okay, I do. So the point is, is my digital horror is unhelpful, is that the the... They're driving along the N3, and Grant sees, oh my word, he's coming from the highway, and he sees this picture. And he goes, oh my word, I've got my family in the car, my young boy's in the car. And the young boy says, oh, but I don't notice it, don't notice it, don't notice it. But the boy goes, Dad, look at that picture. And he goes, oh, he says, look, that lady's got a wedgie. <laughs> what about the emails that we get? I don't know about you, but we've had to block emails coming in. Thank goodness I've got an IT guy like Paul that's able to help us block the stuff. But every day, there's something that comes in that says, hey, why don't you click on here and you can see my naked body and whatever the case is. It's just becoming rife. What about surfing the web? Another humorous story of my wife. I am, I'm going there. So she, you know, she used to do cakes, magnificent cakes. And so now Jenna wanted a cake for her birthday. So she sits down, she's got the laptop or iPad in front of her. I think it was a laptop, actually. It was a laptop. It was my laptop. And uh, she goes, and I'm not going to say that what it is because, you know, there's some young people in there that might even go there. But she, she Googles this particular site, but she forgets to put a certain word in, and up comes a lesbian porn site. And all the kids are gathered around the computer. And instead of just closing the, the laptop, she's, get away, get away. Well, they have, no, what's that? Anyway, what about the social media? You know, Facebook's okay, 
But there's this ghastly thing called Instagram. It's ghastly what you can get up and what you can see on those things. So we can write Jesus off as kind of being out of touch of reality and actually we've, we've kind of got on with things or, or maybe you're now full of guilt and shame around this particular thing. And what we can do is we can do this. And many of us do that. And I'm not also speaking about the fact of appreciation of beauty. There are some beautiful people that live in our world. The thing is, is that we have this cultural definition of beauty and it changes from generation to generation, doesn't it? If you go back to the early 1900s, that, that cultural definition of beauty was maybe a little bit more rounded and whatever. Now we have this different, in the 80s it was like this scrawny, you know, big hair type thing. That I, I don't know why we did all those kind of things. But there are beautiful people that we are attracted to because it's our cultural definition of beauty, both men and women. And we go, wow, that is not sin. That is what we, the Bible calls temptation. And we have this momentary desire which kind of flashes up in front of us when we see a beautiful woman as guys. And Jesus is obviously speaking to men here. And I'm going to focus on men for a little bit. But ladies, this includes you. So, I write this out and I've got a little thing. And some of you have got access to my notes. And you'll see there's a little story that I put in there. But when I say story, it's kind of a generic story. But it actually happened to me on Friday. So I take my two little ones to a swimming gala at St. and Crawford. And... Uh, uh, just before the swimming gala starts, there's this woman who arrives who is our cultural definition of beauty. Scantily dressed and a beautiful woman. And from a neurobiological level, something rises up within me and I start to kind of think about sexual things about this woman. That's not sin yet, is it? Because there's a neurological biological response within us in the way that we've been created. This woman is not my wife. I've never met this woman in, ever in my entire life, yet I'm overcome with this kind of desire. And then fear grips me because I think, what is Louise going to think? No, I'm just kidding. But there's a deep part of me that wants to go there. Not the deepest part, but there's a deep part that wants to go there. And if we're all honest, every single one of us is that we understand that that initial glance is not sin, but it's the second look. We may not be able to help that first look, but it's the second and the third and the fourth look. We may not be able to control temptation, but we can influence it. And uh, here's a quote from Martin Luther who says, We should not make the boistering, the bolstering, sorry, my eyes, that's why I got my glasses, the bolstering of Jesus' teaching too taught here. As if anyone is merely tempted to look at another with lust is eternally damned. I cannot keep a bird flying over my head, but I can certainly keep it from making a nest in my hair or biting off my nose. Well, that kind of says it all, doesn't it? And again, like I've said, the translation from the Koine Greek into the English doesn't really help us. It's a Greek word called blepo, which means to I look. And, and it's not just, there's a number of books, uh, books, uh, books, there's a number of words in Greek that can mean to look. But this one is particularly chosen because it's to look at and to give attention to. The word for lust is using another person's body for sexual gratification. The same word covet is used in this particular. I want this, it's mine. It's the original sin of Adam and Eve at the, the garden, in the Garden of Eden and seeing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and wanting it. It says she lusted after the fruit. And the NIV is unhelpful, but what's helpful is that the ESV says, but I say to you that anybody who looks at a woman with lustful intent. So now we start to get a picture of what Jesus is saying. So he's referring to gazing at a woman to get some kind of sexual gratification from what she looks like. And obviously particularly her body. So, like I've said, the first look is not an issue. It's that second look. And it's imagining yourself in a context of sexual intercourse or interaction with somebody else and starting to fuel that particular fantasy that builds this desire. Similar, so what it's Jesus is saying is it's, it's not about the, the initial look. It's not about the initial anger. It's about what happens in our heart space and how what happens then is when we have that second look, it does something to our hearts and something changes in our hearts because we begin to cultivate it and instead of overriding what's happening, we allow that our will to rise up to go to that place rather than saying no to it. 
And we land up allowing it to take root in our hearts and for it to begin to grow. And there's many women in here, I'm sure, who know the difference between the first and the second look. They've seen that second look in the man's eye. So what Jesus is dealing with us as guys, guys, is the objectification of women. Now, the thing is, is that Jesus is not talking about sexuality and sexual desire. Don't, don't have it. Because we, we land up in churches where we have that. We, we don't even think those things. And we squash sexuality to a place which was never meant to be. We are created as sexual human beings. Jesus knew this. There's a whole book in the Bible that's about eroticism and poetry and, and the engagement of sexuality with a husband and wife in the context of covenant marriage. It's called Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Go and read that. When it's talking about those things, it's talking about the anatomy of a woman, anatomy of a man, not pomegranates. You aren't shorn sheep. There's a celebration of love and sexuality that God wants us to do in the confines of the way that he's put it. Jesus would have grown up hearing all of this around Song of Songs read out every year. He would have understood it. He would have memorized it. He isn't some kind of middle-aged celibate monk with some misogynistic tendencies. Jesus understands the sexuality. He would have been tempted in the same way because he understood that we are the embodiment of God. And what's happened is, is he's now become a man and he understands that we are all sexual human beings that interact in this way and are attracted to one another. Otherwise, we would not procreate. So, the problem is, is when we guys, us guys, when I objectify a woman to satisfy a craving that I have in terms of my sexual desire. And you know what we do? We create Tinder. And that might be a dating site that's on the internet. But actually what we do is we create Tinder that catches fire and does what to our sexual desires? Well, we know where we're going with that, don't we? So, let's... Take a little step aside. What about those ladies that don't fit our cultural definition of beauty? How do they feel? And how much damage have we caused in our society when a particular woman doesn't fit that particular definition and how they're ignored? And the statistics are is that women who fit that cultural definition of beauty get, get a job way easier. Um, they uh, make more money. They get way more attention than anybody else. They have more friends. And boy, do you watch men pander to them on multiple levels. They can make way more mistakes than the woman who doesn't fit that particular definition. And that's how our society has treated women when we objectify them. And really what we've done is we've de dehumanized people, dehumanized women in particular. And uh, why? Because of our own sexual appetites. And really we've just become like animals, to be honest and uh, not like human beings. And we've given ourselves to that primal desire and we're causing problems not only for those who we are objectifying, but even those who we're not. The New Testament calls that our flesh. Mortify the cravings of our flesh. Sorry it's a bit heavy this morning, but this is the word of God. And I think too often, churches are trying to entertain people and give you all the good stuff. But this is the good stuff. Because Jesus is after our hearts. And if we shift our hearts on this, we move into a place of human flourishing like no other. So, we live in a world that no longer believes in moral knowledge. Well, what are you saying, Gary? Well, just like we have natural laws, we have gravity that if I have to kind of drop something, it's going to hit the floor. So we have moral and relational laws. And every single particular um, society that, that you call it a human, throughout human history has understood what this means and understood how, how important it is. And moral and spiritual knowledge has moved more to opinion. No, no, I don't believe that. And I'll just make my opinion around what it is. Or to feelings or some kind of bias based on your, your cultural or uh, ethnic upbringing or tradition. No, no, that's the way it is because I, that's my opinion. That's what I believe. And so what's left is we no longer have the standard or this objective standard of what is good and what is evil, what is moral and what is not. Actually, just do it as long as it makes you feel happy. Even if it's for a moment. And like I've said, every particular culture throughout human history has understood that in order to have a good life, you need to become a good person. And in our world today, that's been pushed apart. So instead of pursuing that particular virtue, no, no, let's just pursue the virtue of our desires. And if you look throughout history again, 
Look at the Roman Empire and before. As soon as humanity started to pursue their own desires, what happened? A cancer started within that particular culture and it fell down with a great, great crash. So, we've got a deeper problem than just purely objectifying of another. We've actually got a deep problem with the adultery of our heart, Jesus is saying. Our hearts are the ones that are failing us. So, we've got a symptom, and Jesus is talking about the symptom. But there's actually a disease. No one wakes up in the morning and goes, flip, I got out the wrong side of my bed. I didn't have my coffee. And by lunchtime, I tripped and I had sex with somebody. No, no, it's, it's a, no, it happened weeks, months, if not years ago. You started that process where you allowed your heart, you had a second look, and now what's happening is your heart has started to change, that you get yourself into a place where now you act on it. Like I said, adultery starts with that second look. When you look to lust, that's when it starts. And like I've said, it does something to your heart. So if we have to look, this is what our world is doing. Our world is trying to move us from a place of love to a place of lust. Why? Because love is patient. Love doesn't need this right now. It doesn't say, well, okay, I'm in a rush and, and, I, and I need to get this place and I'm, I'm not getting old enough. I mean, if you grew up in the 80s like me and you thought that there was going to be a rapture, you wanted to have sex before Jesus came back. Yeah, you see, I mean, these other guys laughing because they were the same. And, and then there's this thing of it's selfless. Because what? Love, love is not self-seeking, but lust is. No, I, I want to objectify a woman. I want to treat her like an object of, of the so that I can grab and it's mine and I'm going to own her. And when I've done with her, I can just push her aside. That's why love is faithful as opposed to lust being a short-term thing. Let me just go from one woman to another. And when I kind of get tired of what's happening, let me just go on to the next one. And then lastly, it is, is love is an act of the will. You choose to love another person on a daily basis. Whereas what does lust do? Well, let my will get drowned out by what I'm lusting after. And the lust rises to a place where I start to act on it and do what I want to do. And so we live in a, a crazy world that's trying to move us from there. Why? Because covenant marriage is not important to get. Let's just live together. Now let's have a movie called Fifty Shades of Grey. A diabolical movie. And how many people go and watch that? Sold out for weeks on end. What about the, the series and the sitcoms on TV that we watch? Do you know that Disney's about to release a kiddies thing on Disney kiddies program about a young man who's struggling with his sexuality and comes out the closet and said he's homosexual? That's going to be aired on Disney Channel, on our DSTVs and whatever the case is, and our kids are going to watch that and think that that's normal. No, no, it's been cultivated. The, 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 the studies have shown that we are not born with those things. It's cultivated in the context of the families that we get up, brought up in. And I'm not going to get into that for, for right now. Instead of saying, you know, in all of those things, when you see these movies and somebody says, you know, and I'm going to say to my wife, I love you. It's, it's not to, to say, no, I, what can I do to, to be selfless in what I'm doing and serve you selflessly? That, that's not what they're saying. They're saying, when can I have sex with you? That, that's what I love you means in our movies and our series and our sitcoms that we see. So, why do you think Jesus is so hardcore on this particular issue? What is the greatest command in the Bible? With? And strength or body. Exactly. And the second is, love your neighbor. So, what happens when sexuality and lusting becomes the idol in our lives? God's no longer there. And certainly what we're doing is we're using the other person as some form of selfish um, gratification. So we're actually breaking both of the two commands that Jesus said were the greatest commands. Not to mention the Ten Commandments themselves, which I won't go into. So what is the way out of this? Because notice that Jesus doesn't command us not to lust. Just like he didn't command us not to get angry. Now, if you're in a religious environment, you're going to feel that Jesus come on you, but he doesn't. He's more like a doctor diagnosing the issue. So he says... If your right eye causes you to stumble, well, gouge it out. You know, otherwise, you're going to end up in a place of hell presently. Now, you're going to live in hell now. What about, you know, just if your hand, or cut off your hand otherwise. So after we've finished, I've got a box of pocket knives here. And what we're going to do is any, anyone, especially the guys who are struggling with lust, we're going to gouge each other's eyes out after the meeting. No, that's not what he's saying. Because if he was saying, well, and, and, and trying to lift up uh, self-mutilation, well, he would have probably told us to cut some other parts of our appendage off, which he doesn't. 
He's being hot. He's using hyperbole. Just like in anger, if you remember, the guy going to Jerusalem to give his offering. This is in Galilee, by the way, while he's doing the Sermon on the Mount. He's walked 120 kilometers. He's staying in front of the altar to give his offering. And what pops into his spirit is, oh my word, my brother's got something against me. Time my offering, walk back 120 kilometers, reconcile with my brother, make friends with him, and walk back another 120 and then give my offering. Who's going to do that? But Jesus is saying it's important enough to do this. And so what he's trying to tell us is we need to deal with this thing. We need to not just put a bandage and take a panada. Or if you're really serious, take a Marprodol. No, he's saying, no, cut it off. Amputate. When this stuff starts, when you find yourself going with a second look, go that way. Do what Job said and make a covenant with your eyes. So, so many men go like, well, no, man, it's 2017. That's not way. Jesus is not, not kind of in this thing. And I'll manage it. You cannot manage sin, ladies and gentlemen. That's what the Pharisees and scribes tried to do. They tried to manage sin, and they tried to perform in this way to, to, to do this stuff. Jesus says, no, amputate. Why? Because otherwise you're going to live in hell now. The Gehenna. Remember, and I explained that the last two weeks ago, what Gehenna really is. The rubbish dump that's burning with dead bodies and carcasses of dogs and cats and animals and flies, and it just burns for 24 hours, 24-7, month on month. That's the picture that he's giving in terms of hell. It's the same thing as an uncontrollable addiction. Ask anybody who's in an uncontrollable addiction, whether it's alcohol, pornography, whatever it might be, you live in a hell because you know that that's not what you've been made and you're not living in the place of human flourishing that Jesus has called us to. I know this all too well as a, as a man. Had my own struggles in this area way too long. And it eats away and it brings about a place where it eats away what you, and you live in the context of a place where God wants you to flourish, but you're actually caught up in an addiction that you can't control. And then you, you lose sexual intimacy with your spouse. And then more than that, what you do is, maybe you don't even have a spouse, you lose the spouse. I know people who have got a divorce because their wives cannot deal with that. What about that crippling guilt and shame that comes? And then if a marriage does break down, the damage, the hell on earth, and all the people that get damaged as a result. We all know that all too well. I remember being in a... Um, at, a, at a, a preschool setup, and I think it was I think it was Dylan's age, so not too long ago, and I think Dylan and one or two others were the only two not from a broken family. I remember divorce is not an unpardonable sin, and I'm going to deal with that in a moment. So don't get all self righteous right now. The point that I'm trying to make is it starts with the second look, it does something to our hearts. Jesus is calling us. Not to do something that's impossible, but to do something that's difficult. And guess what, guys? It's going to cost us. If you remember when I do my spiritual formation, remember the stories we believe, the way we live out our lives, the environment we find ourselves in, the habits that we do. We just go through life. Many of you are going through life, just letting life happen to you. You choose the relationships that you want, and you just go over time just through life experiences, and you live out your life, and then you die. What's the purpose in that? What's the meaning in that? And all of those kind of things. When Actually, our spiritual formation is called to be this. That through teaching, like right now, I'm trying to teach. We teach each other in life groups and in moments. And the Holy Spirit's there. And then he says, actually, here are spiritual practices. Here's a time of silence and solitude. We went away in a spiritual retreat. Should have got some feedback from the guys. I actually forgot this morning just to find out what God had said and done. Why are we not taking the time to take the silence and solitude the daily offices of, of being with Jesus, of journaling, of praying, of, of doing those kind of things. Because when we practice, we break the habit of just letting our story unfold. And we create the new story, Jesus' story, his story for us. And we land up in a community like this and we're around people that we don't choose to be with. I'd never choose to be with Gavin. I'm teasing. I just saw his face when I looked up. But you wouldn't choose, some of you guys wouldn't choose to be around me. But in community, you're around me. And yes, there's encouragement and exhortation, but there's also rub. And in that process, what happens is through life's hard knocks, we start to spiritually, uh, there's a formation spiritually that starts. Not just allowing life to happen to us. So that's what it takes. It takes an apprenticeship to Jesus. It takes that. Why come to church in the morning? And when I say to church, we are the church. So let's not stop that junk. But why come in and spend time? Why go to a life group? Why connect with other Christians? Why not have accountable relationships? Why get in touch with others in a community that you don't necessarily choose your family, but your family chooses you? 
this is not a law of gravity at all, but it's going to cost you. Don't watch some of the movies that you watch. It's unhelpful. I know there's some things that I cannot see. Louise and I went to watch a movie the other day with, um, what's the ex-South African, um, Charlize Theron. Oh, my word. Like, it's supposed to be an action movie, for goodness sake. And then, like, there's this scene, this lesbian scene that is, like, ridiculous. Like, Louise and I just said, is it finished yet? We actually looked at each other. But we could see what was coming. And we could hear. You kind of stop what you're hearing. But you know what's happening on the screen. We need to stop going to those things. What about some of the series we see? Some of the series are even worse than the movies that we, we see. I know the arts can be a great area. And it is a great area at times. But the point is, is that when I go watch a violent movie and one that's action and pow, pow, and skit, scorp, and donna, I don't come out of there going, okay, who can I kill? But if I go into a movie and I see a naked woman who meets my cultural definition of beauty, um, undressed and then having sex with another man, what do you think that does to my heart? Now try not to have a second look there. Try, try not to allow that to start to impact you. And what about these things? These smartphones. They're actually stupid phones. Because what can we get on these things? Some of you need to block. You know the new iPhone has actually got a blocker. For me, Louise knows my code. I can't get into anything. Kerry sent me a thing on a uh, on, uh, woman caught up in, not woman, but woman's, the impact of on women when their husbands are caught up in pornography. And there was a, an article. I couldn't even read it on my phone because it blocks it. I don't know what the code is. Are we doing that for our kids? Are we doing that for our families? Are we putting up the walls and the, the we put up electric fences and walls for our homes to protect us, don't we? But we've got a Wi-Fi system that allows all of this stuff into our home and actually destroys us from the inside out. Those apps, Instagram, it's, it's a terrible app. I've deleted it off my phone. Why? Because there's stuff that pops up on there. Hey, why don't you have a look at this? Hey, Gary, come, come see what, what I've got for you. How about some of you, some young girls and young guys in here? And, and it's not just limited to that because there's some single older people. When you are dating, are you in a home alone with the, op, the, the, the person that you're dating? It's not helpful. We've lived longer than you. I trust you, but I don't trust your hormones. And as our kids start to date, that's the thing. If you go into your girlfriend's house or boyfriend's house or whatever, are you there alone? Not in a... Let, girls, guys, I was once 18, 19, dating a beautiful woman. Thank goodness she's my wife right now. You can have the best intentions in the world, but when your hormones take over, hi, boy. And you know what? I, I want to say this, and it's come to my mind right now. So Louise couldn't keep her hands off me, and it was difficult for me. And, uh, but, but we went, and we, we went to elders in our church that we were part of at the time. And we said, hey, we, we're crossing the line. Now, thank goodness we never had full-on sexual intimacy before we got married. But the, the point is we might as well have. So the point is we, 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 uh, we go to them and we say we're struggling. You know what the response was? Ach, don't worry. It's just the way it is. Oh, I thought it was not good and wrong. Nah. Why? Because I think they had struggled. So now they just tell us, don't worry, it'll happen. But when it happens, just confess it and you'll be okay. No, no, if you're going to struggle with that, come and speak to us. Let us walk, not in judgment. <laughs> Trust me, not in judgment, lest I be judged. Because if I'm pointing one finger at one of you young folks, I'm pointing a whole bunch back at myself. It's not an easy road, and we live in a world that is so against what God has called us to, the way of Jesus, the one which has human flourishing as its goal. Anyway, the point is, is okay, ladies, <laughs> let me address you. So as much as men have a responsibility not to objectify you. There's some great men here. Not perfect men, but great men in this, this place. But we live in a culture that is so against us from not objectifying you. So why don't you help us and understand that you have a power and you have a beauty that when you dress in certain ways, and I was going to put some pictures up and I thought that would be unhelpful, But just watch, watch the Oscars and the latest thing of these. I mean, why bother? 
you know, I mean, we can see three quarters of everything that we don't want to see or we do want to see. Or these short skirts and all kinds of stuff. So the point is, is what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is to understand that your beauty can cause a temptation for another man. Now, in no stretch of the imagination am I saying that if you dress in a certain way, a man has the right to touch you or to say or to do anything from a sexual advance perspective. Please don't misunderstand me. But the point is, is you have a responsibility too. Not only to the men around you, but also some of you meet that cultural standard of beauty and some of you don't. And you've got sisters in here that you can actually cause them to stumble because you're in that place of the cultural standard of, or definition of beauty and they are not. So how do you live out your life and how do you be modest? And the problem is, is that some of you think that, well, the, your definition of our current culture of modesty is not quite where the Bible is setting it. But if you're going to bend over and things are going to show both behind and in front, I think you've maybe underdressed. Here's a hint. The last thing I want to see is someone else's, another woman's breast when she bends over in front of me or if she's behind, if I'm behind her, I see her G-string and I go, oh, there's a wedgie. <laughs> in our day, porn is talked about, even bragged about. Do you know that in our, for our young kids, and I mean, part Louise and I are prayer with our kids coming to a certain age. Kids are sending pic naked pictures of each other when they start dating. It's bizarre. Like, I didn't even, there wasn't even, look, we didn't have smartphones and stuff like that, but it wouldn't even cross my mind. I don't even send naked pictures to my wife of me. Yeah, please don't, she says. <laughs> Thanks, babe. Thanks, my babe. So ladies, honor your bodies and don't objectify your bodies too. That's your responsibility. And I know what when Jesus was talking about was it was a culture where women were clothed just like we see in the Middle East now. You know, they were covered in, in long dresses and, and it was quite difficult for a man to land up in a place of temptation because everything, you couldn't see anything. And, that's what, and I'm not talking about that that's what it is. But in our current day, I'm also realizing more and more women are getting addicted to pornography. So as much as Jesus is talking to men here, I think we've got to say, no, no, it's actually two women as well who are starting to find themselves in that place as well. And, and please don't go into a place of indifference and go, ah, that's just the style right now. No, no, actually there is a place that when my daughter Jenna is about to walk outside and I go, no, you're not wearing that. Not, not, not only for your sake, but actually for the sake of the young guys who are going to be gawking at you and not just having the second and third, but actually you're going to do something to their hearts. So for their protection as well as yours, no, I think you need to go and put on, not uh, Ella's t-shirt, but your own. <laughs> I'm also not saying, let's dress up like the Middle Easterns, or actually don't wear makeup and just wear skirts and don't wear pants and, you know, let's just become a cult. I'm not saying that at all. But for order for us to live into Jesus' vision of human flourishing for us, this is so important. This is so important. And then lastly, and I know I've been a bit longer today, but this is quite a big topic. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of a divorce. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Jesus is teaching in the context of an oral culture. What does that mean? Do you know that every Jewish person would have memorized the Torah? Memorized. So when he's quoting the Torah, they would have known the context to which that was in. And what is he quoting here? He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 24. So let's have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 24. It's bizarre. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, and he gives it to her, and he sends her from the house, and if after she leaves the house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes a certificate of divorce, there's a bit of a pattern to this woman. I'm just teasing. And gives to her and sends her out from the house, or if he dies, then after her first husband who has divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Now here's, here's the, the important thing. is I'm not going to give you a discourse on whether when divorce and remarriage are allowed and all those kind of things. Because this is not the text. 
So if you want to go and you want to read up on it and you've been in that place, go get that book. It's a great book. And as you can say, the guy's name is David N. Stone Brewer. And he deals with this on a very methodical basis, exegetically, exegetically that word, um, and, and very well. So go and read that. I'm not going to give you a huge discourse on this. What Moses is trying to do is he's trying to mitigate, against, again, in the culture, the disastrous impact on women in the context of divorce. If you go read that whole context, what's happening is men, they would go, well, you know what? Um, I've decided to divorce you. You're out. And women would land up in a place where they weren't any longer with their mother and father. They'd left them. They were now thrown out of the, from their husband's home, and they were left destitute in the road. And most of them would turn to prostitution. And guess what? Within five years, the husband would go, oh, yuck, I made a mistake. Come back in. So Moses is speaking into that. He's actually taking on the men and saying, actually, you guys need to pull certain parts of your anatomy out, the nether regions of other parts of your anatomy, because you're missing the point. And actually, you are treating women, and you've made them a victim of divorce. So important to understand that, because they were being treated like property. They were being objectified, because, oh, there's a, there's a nice-looking woman over there. Let me divorce you so that I can be with her. So what Jesus is doing, though, is he's entering into an age-old debate where there was a rabbi called Halal who lived a generation before Jesus who said, well, let's interpret this particular text. And where it says something indecent, really what that means is anything at all. So maybe you don't like your wife's cooking. You just kick her into touch. <laughs> maybe she just gave you some gears around something that you did. Well, you just kick her into tax, give her her certificate of divorce, and she's gone. Why? Because a rabbi, a leader, said this is the way you interpret it. That's why Jesus, again, is saying, you've heard it said. Now, I'm telling you what the right interpretation is. And actually, no, it's all about only in the context of adultery, only in the context where she's been unfaithful to you. And he's trying to deal with that particular setup. And that's what Moses was trying to do. So, the objectification of women and this particular issue are linked. And it's not some kind of you know, difference between the two. And uh, I've said to you, try and get that book if you want to go. And I know there's some divorced people in here. It's not the unpardonable sin. And actually there are places. And actually if that's where you've gone, there's a process for you to walk in healing and in human flourishing despite what your past may look like. Even if it is your mistake. And I'm not going to go there. But that's what Jesus is trying to do. And too many people take Matthew chapter 5. I remember reading an article, not even an article, a paper that was done by one of the leaders in, a city, in the city here saying that, that because marriage is such a picture of Jesus and the church, that if we choose to divorce, we can never marry again for the rest of our lives. It's a total warpness if you're just taking this text. Let's go to other texts in Matthew. Let's go to other texts in the, in the New Testament where Paul speaks about this. And it's important for us that when we make a... Uh, a dogmatic approach on this without looking at all the texts that God has put in place and without looking at the meta-narrative of a loving God, we can come out with a legalistic and just pour coals on people's head because they've made a mistake. We're not there. We're not a community who's going to advocate that at all. Anyway, the point is, he's beating up on halal. <laughs> he's not beating up on the scriptures. He's saying that man was wrong and you believed him. That's not how you interpret it. This is how you interpret it. Now here, yeah, we go again, okay, well, it's not such a big thing anymore. But as a general rule, what are women attracted to in men? Power. Status. Luis says abs, but it's not true. What are, what are, what are men attracted to? Beauty. As men get older, they get more and more status, don't they? Higher positions in companies, more wealth. More all of those kind of things. More power. What happens when a woman gets older? Their beauty starts to fade. So even in our day and age, divorce, on that level, what does it do? It favors the men, not the woman. A man who's 50 or 60 and is full of status and whatever else will find a wife relatively easy. But a woman who's 50, 60 years old will struggle to find a, a, a husband if she does not meet the cultural definition of beauty. So we live in that. So let's not also say that Jesus is out of touch with reality about what's happening. And what Jesus is saying, it's not about contract, it's about covenant. It's about our hearts, and it's about our heart posture towards Jesus. And even in the context of adultery, 
If we're a follower of Jesus and we're an apprentice of Jesus, then we should still be in a posture of how do we make this work despite the failings of my spouse. That should be the place that we go to first, not just, oh, you're out of here. So, to close, to conclude, it's a call to honor each other ultimately. Not to objectify women. Maybe you've had a divorce. Maybe you've got a porn addiction. Maybe you've made inappropriate comments. Maybe you dress way too sexily as a young lady or even as an older lady. The point is, as you come before God and you confess it and you deal with it. Sexual sin is not the be-all and end-all. It's sin just like any other sin. But it is against the body and it is far-reaching. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. But it is sin. All of this is sin. Now you can go, oh, don't speak sin. No, no. It's against God's economy. It's against God's way of human flourishing. And the problem problem is, is we live in a world that kind of says, no, sex is simply biological. It's a biological release. So go sow your wild oats. Go check it out. Go do what you want. That's what the world is selling us. They're also saying that marriage is some kind of uh, social construct from the the Byzantine era. That actually, no, marriage is actually really oppressive, so get out of it and free yourself from it. That's the world we live in. It's moving us from love into lust. Just live and let live, man. Try and bed as many girls as you can, guys, and uh, just enjoy it. But you know what? You are going to not live in the kingdom of heaven, in the place of human flourishing that Jesus has designed when we walk his way. So you can live that story if you really want to. You can live the story that the world wants to portray for you, and you can get up every day and you can do that. But you know what? I don't know that living just to make yourself happy, I, when I look out there, I don't know. And you know what? In the context of what happens with marriage and everything else, we have a fatherless uh, generation and full of damaged kids that just perpetuates this particular cycle. I think there's a better story. It's the one Jesus is telling us. And the better story is one that is made for human flourishing, where we are made in the image of God, where we celebrate our sexuality where we actually rule and reign like we're supposed to, even over our flesh and our sexuality. There is meaning in life. It's not this meaningless, I just let life happen. No, there's meaning and there's purpose. And you know what? It does matter who you become the side of eternity. So, sexuality is not just a biological release, ladies and gents. Marriage is not some kind of social construct. No, it's about two autonomous people coming together, really infusing themselves in the context of covenant marriage. And coming together regularly to do that and actually have a place of intimacy that generates an increased intimacy with the Father. It's healthy sexuality. And so, lastly, let's be a community that walks in human flourishing the way Jesus has called us to. Because it's out of that place, the way of Jesus, the most compelling story, the news that's too good to be true, the good news, the place of human flourishing that he wants us to be. So let's stand.